East Neighborhood Association. Uh, Lower Hill East Neighborhood Association, or Lena. Thank you for joining us for this Lena talk. Uh, we have three great speakers here tonight. We're gonna talk about uh, green energy solutions. Um, this is our first Lena talk of the year. And our speakers are Julia Eagles, Virginia Rudder, and Carmen Carruthers. Each speaker will talk about their work in the green energy field from a consumer policy and energy supplier standpoint, where are things headed in energy, sustainability, climate, and the environment, what practical steps can people in the wedge and other local communities in Minneapolis take to support clean energy and help advance clean energy economy. After each speaker talks, we'll have a Q&A session with the community. All three speakers will have an opportunity to answer green energy uh, questions from the community. So if you have a question, um, you can put it in the chat and we'll try to answer as many as we can. This talk will be recorded and shared publicly for future viewings. Before we get started, I just want to review Lena's online code of conduct. Lena is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that represents the Minneapolis community of Lowry Hill East, also known as The Wedge. We welcome discourse, but we ask that everyone here be respectful when they speak or comment on Zoom and Facebook. Please respect the views of others without personal attacks. We also ask that you leave yourself on mute unless called on. If your comments are in violation of our online policy, a moderator will give you a warning. If your comments continue to violate our online code of conduct, you will be removed from the talk. Deliberately unmuting and causing a disruption, cursing, or the use of hate speech will lead to immediate removal. We're looking forward to a great talk. Uh, as I said, we're honored to have three great speakers tonight to talk about their work in green energy solutions. Julia Eagles is the Associate Director of Utility and Regulatory Strategy at the Institute for Market Transformation. She formerly, uh, she formerly was with Excel Energy, and we'll talk about her energy, uh, energy work, sustainability, and climate work across the public, private, and nonprofit sector. Virginia Rudder is the Manager of Community Relations for Clean Energy Economy, Minnesota, and formerly with Solar, Ener uh, Solar United Neighbors. She will cover CEM's main two reports, the Minnesota State Energy Fact Sheet and the Clean Jobs Midwest Report. Carmen Carruthers is the Outreach Director for the Citizens Utility Board and will discuss how neighbors can get help with energy bills and advocate for themselves at the state level. After each of our speakers uh, has opportunity to talk, we're gonna take questions from the community. So I wanna thank all the speakers for being here. We're gonna start with Julia. Great. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, thanks, Peter, for the invite. Uh, I was going to say, I, I would have been happy just spending the whole hour talking about saunas, um, but I'm also here to talk about energy. So uh, I live over in Powderhorn Park in South Minneapolis, so not too far. Um, and as my bio mentioned, I've, I've worked in a bunch of different parts of the energy industry. So I was just going to give a little overview of kind of the spaces that I've been in and then talk a little bit more about my current role, um, the work we do and some of the work that we're doing specifically um, in Minneapolis. We work nationally, but we are doing a good amount of work with the city of Minneapolis. Um, so I started in the energy industry something like uh, 15 years ago or so. Um, and the first job that I had was running a small neighborhood based uh, energy cooperative in the Phillips neighborhood. So we were doing a lot of um, energy efficiency education and outreach. So supporting community members there to learn about ways to save energy and running an energy efficient appliance trade-in program. So I didn't have a background in energy at all. I got into it sort of in a, an outreach role, um, but it got me pretty hooked uh, on the potential for you know climate impacts, carbon reduction impacts of energy work, but also just the need for a lot more education and in a like a very community based approach, which it feels like I've in some ways come full circle um, to in this current role. Um, but that was a very sort of bottom up grassroots effort um, that doesn't exist anymore. But there's there's kind of there's some lasting legacies or some um, programs that still exist that are like that. Uh, from that position, I moved on to work with a program called the Clean Energy Resource Teams that works statewide uh, to support community groups to plan and implement clean energy programs. Um, they have a like a chapter, a group that works within the metro region specifically um, and works with communities through small seed grant funding and other technical support, again, to plan and implement clean energy projects. Uh, from there, I... I went to grad school and um, while I was there, I did work for the city of Minneapolis and their sustainability office. And it was at the time while they were finalizing the city's climate action plan, which I believe they're actually updating this year, um, but that was 
2013, 2014. Um, so they were working on their climate action plan. It was also when they were having a conversation about municipalizing. So the franchise agreements with Excel and Centerpoint were up um, and the city was considering the potential to become a municipal utility. Um, so lots of interesting talk around that. Um, and they also passed their building benchmarking ordinance. So the requirement for buildings to report on their energy usage, which is very much um, relevant to what I do now. Um, and then from there, I went on to work for Excel Energy. So I worked um, with the investor and utility here for about five years. I was in their regulatory affairs department. Um, so Excel is a regulated utility doing filings with the Public Utilities Commission, and then the Energy and Environmental Policy team, which is the group that helped develop Excel's voluntary carbon commitment. So their 80 by 2030, carbon free by 2050 carbon reduction goal. And I've been with IMT just a little over two years. Um, we are, like I said, a national nonprofit. We're actually based in DC, but we've got staff remote around the country, about 30 people. Uh, and we work primarily on advancing high performance buildings um, through local and state government policies and real estate engagement. Um, so it's, we're very buildings focused, um, but that touches a lot of different things, again, around policy, around utilities and regulatory work, um, around real estate work. And we really see a lot of opportunity in buildings. Um, buildings account for about a third of our overall emissions nationally. Um, and for cities, when you look just at the greenhouse gas emissions footprint of cities, it's an even higher percentage. It varies a little bit, but some, for some cities, it's up to 80%. Um, so it's a really key climate solution um, for yeah, reducing carbon emissions. And, and kind of one of the spaces I work in is how buildings can also be part of grid solutions. So how they connect to the electric grid and interact. Um, so by improving how and when they use energy, um, buildings again can help us reduce carbon emissions and support the grid. Um, our organization just last week was involved in the launch of a national building performance standards coalition. Um, so this is in partnership with the White House. Um, and right now we've got a group of 33 state and local governments committed to exploring equitable building retrofit policies by Earth Day 2024. So again, a lot of cities are seeing buildings as a big part of their climate solutions. Um, and a number of them have signed on uh, to that commitment. We've got something like uh, six or so different cities and states that have already passed building performance standards. So this will really expand um, the number of cities making that commitment. So the way building performance standards work is that you set a performance target for buildings over time. So it's based on energy use or carbon emissions, also looks at gas and water use, um, and ways that you can improve indoor air quality and comfort um, and take into account sort of other social priorities. We know that buildings, um, there's a lot of overlap there with um, just housing costs and affordability. And so really also taking into account how are we passing these policies with consideration of, of mitigating impacts that that might have on um, housing affordability in particular. But we see building performance standards as a real opportunity to improve community health and resilience and economic opportunity, lots and lots of job opportunities around energy efficiency. Um, Virginia might talk more about that. Um, and that buildings can be really key to boosting climate resilience. Um, so again, we've seen cities across the country experience pretty severe weather events in terms of heat waves and storms. Um, power outages, air pollution. So really looking at how buildings can be a part of that, um, providing community resilience. Uh, in Minneapolis, there, the city has done quite a bit of work um, on building improvements and building policies. Like I said, there is the building benchmarking ordinance, which is around um, reporting energy usage in larger commercial buildings. We do have a policy around um, time of sale and time of and uh, time of rent energy reporting requirements. So for smaller, um, you know, single family duplex triplex buildings that aren't necessarily required to do the building benchmarking, uh, you can get that information about how much energy your building or home uses. Uh, and have they have a sustainable building policy for projects that get city funding um, and have done a lot of improvements to city owned buildings. So the space that I work in is really at the intersection of building performance policy and utilities. Uh, so we help local governments that we work with and community partners to engage with their utilities and their utility regulators 
to influence energy policy and regulation that will accelerate equitable building decarbonization solutions. So we see utilities as having a really important role in the success of these building policies. Sometimes it's around sharing data. Um, it's really looking at how our buildings and the policies around buildings considered in their planning processes. And I'll give a little example of that with some of our recent work. Um, and, and again, there's there's a lot of um, discussion just about the role that utilities can play in not only ensuring affordability, which is a, a key part of how they're regulated, but really look at um, energy burden among customers and the differences of, of how different customer, um, you know, communities and customers are impacted by energy usage and, and ways that they can help to empower some of those local visions of energy justice, which I will acknowledge they are not leaders on now, but is the space that we're really trying to push. Um, so the, the most recent example, and even just this week, um, we've been involved in some of the, the proceedings at the Public Utilities Commission um, around the Xcel Energy Integrated Resource Plan. Um, so we've been supporting both the city of Minneapolis, um, a coalition of other cities in Excel's territory, and some local community-based organizations um, that have been wanting to engage in this planning proceeding um, about how Excel is going to generate electricity in the upper Midwest for the next 15 years. Um, so those are lots of like technical decisions, um, lots of data goes into these proceedings. It's a very legal process, um, but there's also increasingly a conversation about how do we take into consideration the past harms of the energy system and also the future opportunities to um, look at how we're equitably distributing the benefits um, and reducing burdens on those impact those communities that have been disproportionately impacted in the past. Um, and that's not something that has off, that has been formally considered in the planning process, but um, the city and a number of other partners and, and Cub um, Carmen's organization is also doing a lot of work in this space. So the city of Minneapolis has been recommending accelerated retirement of Excel's fossil fuel fleet. So they still have um, coal, but have committed to close all their coal in the upper Midwest by 2030 um, and have made some plans around gas that there's a lot of um, the contention around, and that's that's going to be a major decision point within this uh, proceeding, looking at how they include more distributed generation in the plan and how they look at some of those equity considerations in the planning process. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned. There will be a decision on that um, in the next month or so. Uh, and again, we're seeing a lot more community groups participate, um, including neighborhood organizations, looking at how to how to be more involved in that regulatory process um, and just kind of advancing energy efficiency solutions at the local level. Um, and we're also uh, supporting Excel in their integrated distribution plan that's coming up. Um, they filed in November and they'll be um, accepting comments on that. So that's really looking at how the utility plans their distribution system, the poles and wires and substations that we see in our neighborhoods. Um, and looking at some of the same priorities around more distributed energy resources, how they're planning for more rooftop solar and electric vehicles and storage and efficiency, um, and ways that they can look at some of those technologies as solutions to traditional um, alternatives to traditional distribution system investments. So I will wrap up with that, um, just to say, again, we really focus on how each of these utility planning processes and energy decisions really are ultimately about people and energy users. Um, so how can we consider more of those impacts as a part of the planning process and expand uh, participation in that overall? And I'm happy to talk more about that and some of the questions, but I'll, I'll hand it off. Awesome, thank you, Julia. Um, so we have a question, we'll get to it after. Um... Virginia and Carmen speak, but if you have a question for any of the speakers, just put it in the chat and we'll get to in a few minutes. Next up, uh, we're going to have Virginia um, speak for a few minutes. Uh, Virginia. Great. And then if I could be able, and they're perfect. All right, let me share my screen. Sorry. 
trying to get my screen share. All right, are you able to see the screen? Yes. Perfect. All right, so I'm Virginia Rudder. I've actually had a title change in the last couple of weeks. So I am now our Director of Engagement and Strategic Initiatives with Clean Energy Economy Minnesota or SEAM. And we are a small but mighty nonprofit organization that brings that business case of clean energy to policymakers and the broader public. So um, we do a lot of storytelling around the impact of clean energy jobs and clean energy projects throughout Minnesota. And we lobby at the Capitol for smart clean energy policy. And we are a member-led nonprofit, so we're not a trade organization, but we work with a variety of businesses from very small, you know, one to three person shops installing solar up to Fortune 100 and 500 companies like Target and Mortensen. So um, we, in part of our storytelling, we use data. Um, and so I'm going to talk through two reports, our Minnesota Energy Fact Sheet and Clean Jobs Midwest. Um, and I have a little video first on our fact sheet. The 2021 Minnesota Energy Fact Sheet shows the state is undergoing a dramatic clean energy transition, setting new milestones in clean energy deployment and a commitment to energy efficiency. In 2020, and for the first time, renewables were the leading source of electricity generation in Minnesota. A key factor for this can be attributed to the creation of 588 megawatts of new capacity, all from clean, renewable energy sources. Ranking first in the Midwest for energy efficiency in 2020, the state's energy productivity has grown 24% since 2011. And Minnesota's power sector emissions have fallen 40% over the last decade. In that time, natural gas used for electricity tripled, while coal use fell by half. Prior to the pandemic, nearly 62,000 Minnesotans worked in clean energy. Those jobs were growing two and a half times faster than the rest of the economy. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, over 9,000 clean energy workers lost their jobs. Clean energy can help Minnesota's economy get back in business. Get the facts about Minnesota's energy and where it is heading. Download the 2021 Minnesota Energy Fact Sheet today. So our fact sheet looks at our electricity generation and usage in the state and how it's changed over the last year. And these are some of my favorite facts. So last year was our first time that renewable electricity generation was the largest single source of um, electricity in the state. So it's super exciting. And then if you add in nuclear, we had the majority of our electricity generated from zero carbon sources. And as a result of that, we've seen our, our power sector emissions fall 40% um, in the last decade, um, which is great, but we're not meeting our carbon reduction goals for the state. And this is due to buildings and transportation and some other sectors that I think are a little bit harder to decarbonize. Um, we're seeing a bunch of big Minnesota corporations that are making commitments around renewables, um, and that's part of their commitments for climate, other sustainability issues, and also just because of the economics of it. And um, we are the number one state in the Midwest for energy efficiency, ninth in the nation. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of EV adoptions um, increasing over the last five years, which I think is, is exciting and is going to ramp up much faster now that there are more manufacturers making commitments to create electric vehicle options. So our Clean Jobs Midwest report, so there's um, something sort of highlighted in the um, in the video a little bit too about, you know, during the pandemic, we lost jobs. 
and this happened across the state in all sectors of our economy. Um, and so we ended up with 55,300 employees um, in our clean energy industry. And this is the first time since we've started collecting these data that we've seen that decline. But we've been able to rebound faster um, than the broader workforce in the state. And these jobs are found across the state. Um, so, you know, it's somewhat proportional to our population. So there's about 40% in greater Minnesota, 60% in the metro. And 71% of these jobs are found in companies with fewer than 20 employees. So small businesses are really driving the growth in our industry. The bulk of our jobs in Minnesota are in energy efficiency. And so this includes, you know, your traditional HVAC, your really high efficiency HVAC, lighting, building controls, um, and it's about 75% of our jobs in Minnesota are in this sector or subsector. And we have a new growth of advanced transportation. So in Minnesota, we have an electric bus company. We have a company that manufactures pieces for Tesla um, and their, their um, manufacturing process. And this sector has been the largest growth um, sector across the Midwest, including in Minnesota. And looking across the types of jobs that we see in our clean energy industry, most of them are construction. And you know that's because it's a lot of installation of whether it's the energy efficiency equipment or whether it's solar, um, there's just a lot of jobs to do that kind of work. And we also have jobs you know, across different sectors, finance, professional services, um, utility regulation. So lots of, lots of opportunities, but mostly in construction. And um, we did have an interesting little fact that our wind industry subsector grew 8% in 2020, even though like renewable generation overall had lost jobs. And this is just due to the, the boom bust cycle of the incentives at the federal level. And I think we're starting to understand, or hopefully policymakers are starting to understand the importance of maintaining those over a longer term to allow for those jobs to maintain. Um, but we had, there were just a lot of projects that we're trying to finish up before those were to sunset in 2020. And as I said, you know, these jobs are all across our state. Um, so it's, it's a nice thing when we're talking with policymakers about how these jobs do span across Minnesota. And then I think, you know, this is something that Julia was talking a little bit about, but there's a huge opportunity in our industry for clean jobs. Um, the the building piece i think you know this the 2030 the sb 2030 and like other stretch codes on, on building performance we could have another like 30,000 jobs and looking at those national policies like build back better and the infrastructure bill we're looking at thousands of electricians welders and wind technicians so i think it's it's an industry we have a bunch of solar installer members and they're telling me that they are always hiring electricians. Um, and it, this is kind of a, a tricky thing to talk through because we're in a job shortage already in Minnesota and globally. But I do think, you know, the ways that our industry is growing and the amount of investment that's being made in this energy transition is leading to lots of job opportunities. And I think one thing that people don't necessarily think about with clean energy is the need for data analysis and software developers, because as we have more and more smart meters or, you know, smart grid aspects, we need people who can understand those data that are coming in and process it and design those programs 
that will allow our grid to continue to operate smoothly. So I'm happy to ask or answer any questions that anyone has after Carmen's presentation. Awesome. Um, thank you, Virginia. Um, next up is Carmen Carruthers. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all on this cold Minnesota <laughs> evening. Um, and so I'm here uh, to talk about resources for you all as energy consumers. So I'll be, um, I work for the Citizens Utility Board. I'm the outreach director. So I spend a lot of time talking to energy consumers across the whole state. And um, our organization is, it's a nonprofit independent consumer advocate. So our role is really to um, be looking out for the best interests of consumers when it comes to both policy issues, a lot of the things that Julia was, was talking about. And um, also when it comes to giving information to consumers so they can make really good decisions for their households. So providing all of the information and links to resources um, that you might need when you're talking about your own household's energy use. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about um, the organization and the type of work we do. And um, also talk about the services that are available to you as, um, as consumers free of charge. So part of our group um, is outreach, that's where I work. And this is me and my cat Puff, which you might, may or may not see later on in the evening and then my colleague Hannah. And as you can tell, we're working from home um, primarily now. Um, but with our outreach program, we give um, presentations on various topics, just like we are tonight. Every presentation is a little bit different um, based on the interests of the audience, but really focusing on um, tips for consumers um, where they can save energy, save money, take advantage of programs and rebates. We also um, are at community outreach events, um, tabling, handing out information, having conversations um, with, with people. And then the other thing that we'll do that I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes is we do free energy bill consultations. So we'll sit down with you and your energy bills, go over them and help give you customized suggestions for your household um, to meet your energy goals. The other side of our organization is focused on advocacy, which um, was something that Julia referenced. And so we're involved at the, the state level on a lot of policy issues and how they're going to affect consumers. So again, looking out for the interests of consumers. So very active at the Public Utilities Commission. So um, I'm guessing the majority of you are probably Centerpoint and Excel customers. And um, both of those um, utility companies are regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. They're investor owned utilities, meaning um, they have investors and shareholders and they're for profit companies. So the Public Utilities Commission oversees um, the programs that they, they run, how they run their business, what rates they set, and we're involved when decisions are being made. So um, there's rate cases happening right now where Excel and Centerpoint um, would like to raise your rates and there's other um, utilities across the state do, wanting to do the same. Um, Julia referenced the IRP where um, they're looking at kind of the future of how energy is going to be produced in the state. So active in things like that. Um, also active at the state legislature. So when there's um, bills being proposed that affect energy consumers, we may have a role um, in you know, helping provide information and advocating for, for certain decisions or changes to those bills. Um, so many of you, if you've looked at your energy bills recently, you've probably noticed your costs are changing. And, and when I say changing, going up um, right now. So there is um, a huge uh, fluctuation in natural gas prices and then also in propane prices. If, if you um, know folks in rural Minnesota or if, or if you have, um, you visit there. So this is impacting a lot of people and just, you know, re these recent bills that people are receiving, it's really becoming noticeable. Uh, this is like, it's an economic force issue. It's a market issue um, that's getting passed on to us as consumers. In addition to that, um, many of the natural gas companies in the state are also recovering costs from a big price spike that happened last February. You might recall the issues in Texas and they're seeking to recover some of those costs um, through 
through their, their customers. And so you're seeing there'll be a line item on your bill talking about that. So these things combined um, are really putting pressure on, on people's budgets when it comes to energy issues. So these are things that, um, that we're really trying to stay on top of and keep people informed and also help them through it. So one of um, our key services, and this is available to all of you if you're interested, are um, free energy bill consultations. So um, pre-pandemic days, um, we would go and do these on site. We did a lot of workplace events, like over the, the lunch hour and make these available where we, we sit down with people. You can see us with paper and people's bills. We ask um, a ton of questions about people's energy use and um, are really trying to provide useful customized information to them. So, you know, what is it that's the concern to you or what questions do you have about your energy use? And we'll have a discussion with you to help you um, figure out what options might be a good fit for your household. Identify programs and rebates that could be a good fit, give you tips and tricks of how to reduce your energy use, but still stay comfortable. And um, when we've met, met with people, we've kind of calculated if they would follow our recommendations, the average consultation results in about $150 savings that first year. The consultations take about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so we feel like they're a pretty good use of your time. And when we're, um, when we're doing these consultations, we're trying to identify where the opportunities exist to save energy. So we ask a lot of questions um, such as, do you rent or own your home? Because that impacts the, the options you have to control some of the factors affecting your energy use. Um, how big is your home? How many people live in it? How do you heat it? How do you cool it? What are your temperature settings? Um, a wide variety of, of questions um, for how many people live in your home and what are their schedules? So during the pandemic, if many of you were at home more than normal, which I'm guessing many of you were, you probably noticed your energy bills went up. The more we're home, the more energy we're consuming. So we're really trying to kind of get a gauge on that. And then we compare it to what we would expect based on those characteristics and then identify easy opportunities for you to either do some behavioral change or investigate other things you might be able to do to your home to make it more efficient, for example. We often are referring people to the Home Energy Squad to get a, a home energy audit. We provide links to rebates that you can be eligible for. If people are interested in renewable energy, we connect them to resources to look into those things. So those are just some examples. Um, and so this is um, the information of how you can sign up. And I can put that in the chat too after I'm, I'm done speaking so you can get a direct link. But we have bill consultations. We do them twice a month um, just as a set schedule. So one over the lunch hour and then one kind of late afternoon, early evening that you can sign up for. Or you can always reach out and request a specific time. And we can do them during the evening hours too um, with enough notice. So I just did one at six o'clock right before this, this meeting. And I was like, I got to finish up before, before seven. Um, the other thing we've been doing a lot of, especially since the pandemic, is we've kind of served a, a little bit as a hotline um, where people who are struggling to pay their bills um, and worried about getting shut off give us a call. And we've talked to hundreds of people since the pandemic who are in these kind of situations. So in those situations, we're really focused on immediate things they can do to get help paying their bills and to avoid to prevent that shutoff from happening. So we're referring a lot of people to energy assistance programs, um, other affordability programs that might exist, um, understanding enough of their situation to suggest um, you know, reliable resources for them to seek out. So that's been um, a big change we've seen in, in um, our work in the last couple of years, but something we expect to continue um, to provide services for going forward. And then when it comes to policy issues, um, you know, with our involvement at the Public Utilities Commission and the legislature, we're frequently writing blogs and including information in our website about different issues that we think are important for consumers to be aware of. So I highly encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. It is very consumer focused. Um, and so it's, we try not to be overly technical, but you can get some of that out of there too if you're really into energy issues. But in those articles, we'll often highlight opportunities for the public to make their voice heard and the best ways of doing that. So we try to keep on top of um, different efforts that are out there where people are seeking comments and how to best go about making those comments. 
And that concludes my time and I'm looking forward to questions. So thank you. Thank you, Carmen. And thank you all uh, for all the great work you're doing. Um, I have a few questions. We're gonna get started here. Uh, so uh, here's a question. This one's for Julia. What challenge? What challenges have you encountered, if any, when pushing for building energy efficiency improvements in areas that aren't served by regulated utility, i.e. areas served by co-ops, which are quite wide, widespread across greater Minneapolis or Minnesota? Mm -hmm. And Carmen, and probably Virginia could weigh in on this too, um, because we, my organization focuses primarily on larger metro areas because we're passing building policies um, that are impacting more buildings within large cities. So we don't do as much work in um, rural areas where there's a lot of co-ops, but I mean, a major thing is that there's not the same um, regulation and policies that apply to the co-ops. Uh, so, you know, Excel and Centerpoint and the other regulated utilities have requirements to meet a certain level of energy efficiency or energy savings, and that doesn't apply to the co-op. So they may have they their have, own sort of internal interests, but yeah. They have a different they, level. They yeah. still do them. They okay. do have like the conservation requirements. It's just a different amount of like spending and change. Right, and there, there's a few that I think that are exempted because of this, the number of customers they have. Um, but I also kind of chime in too that a lot of these efficiency requirements come out of building codes. So if you have areas that are not subject to building codes, unincorporated areas, then there's there's fewer, fewer tools to require those types of levels of efficiency. And there is a push this year, like will be a push this um, legislative session to improve building performance standards at the state level. Um, I know that Chair Long um, in the House is very motivated on this. Um, and I think it's, it had moved far last year. Um, the challenge is that some of the Republican legislators are more comfortable with it being a voluntary program, so more of like a stretch code thing where the state's level would be one like here and then cities or counties could do something that's higher um, and they choose to do it. And then my understanding is that the, the um, labor unions and like contractors really just wanted one standard just that so they know what it is everywhere across the state. And so that's been this push pull conversation um, at the state level. How can people get involved, you know, with the uh, policy, if they have an interest, you know, who, who is the best person for them to reach out to? If they're interested in pushing for policy. I, I think um, I'll start, I guess. I think that the best the best person to reach out to would be your legislator and tell them about what is important to you. Um, they love hearing from constituents and they, you know, like that is impactful for you to tell them like what matters to you. If you're interested in specific topics, um, our website has some information on like our policy priorities. And we're um, very lucky in Minnesota to have a really robust community of energy organizations and advocates, as well as like broader environmental advocates. We have a strong nonprofit community. So like Fresh Energy, um, Great Plains Institute, CUB, we all have information on our websites that helps to understand kind of what's happening at the legislative level in our energy area. Great. Thank you. Well, here's another question this is for uh, anyone who wants to chime in. Is municipalization a good idea for Minneapolis? Spicy question, Peter. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll speak, uh, you know, I worked for Excel for a number of years and that the conversation in um, Minneapolis was in part inspired by conversations that have been going on in Boulder, Colorado for many, many years. And I will say it's like a very complicated and expensive thing to do retroactively in that it involves buying all the utilities assets. So there's just sort of the like practical considerations um, around how much 
work it is versus like what are other things you can do to push your utility um, as is, which, you know, we've made some progress in Minneapolis with the clean energy partnership on that, although maybe not as much as some would hope. Um, and the other thing that I would say is we work with some municipal utilities across the country and they're not always better in my experience. They're not always, they're not regulated in the same way. Um, and, and as much as you would like them to be aligned with the city level policy, I'd say there's some leaders, Los Angeles has a really good one, um, Seattle, like there's cities that are doing more with their municipal utilities, but that alone isn't necessarily going to achieve um, all the city's climate goals. I don't know if others are way in. Carmen of Virginia, you want to have any thoughts on this question? I mean, I would echo Julia's comments. I think the the law in Minnesota says that you have to pay for like the the fair market value of all of Excel's investments in Minneapolis, and so it's just a huge number. Um, and so I think you know the the city has had a lot of success in leveraging their contracts with Excel and you know the the agreement their franchise agreement to operate in the city um, and I think they've been responsive to the city's push especially with the PUC comments that the city's been filing um, so I think that there it's hard to see how it would really work well. And I think kind of building on some of those comments about, um, you know, asking the utility to do more, there's, you know, a number of like different community organizations are getting really more involved in um, our neighbor, you know, like neighborhood organizations, community-based organizations involved in trying to influence different um, programs and who's being served and how, where the energy is coming from. So I think there's always more opportunity for citizen involvement, which, you know, maybe doesn't have the, the same effect, but can make improvements in, in how our energy is delivered. Thank you. Here's another question. Uh, in 2040, do you think more megawatts of solar or wind will be installed in Minnesota? I'm sure that's directed to me and I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I will say that Currently in Minnesota, we have something like six gigawatts of renewable generation, and two thirds of that is wind, and solar is about one fifth. So wind is a, a bigger chunk of our generation right now. Um, we saw a, a rapid expansion of solar as part of the community solar program, especially in 2017 and 18, solar fast outpaced the um, the construction of wind in Minnesota. And then in 2020, that flipped. So um, I think it's changing. I think that, you know, looking at the, the areas in which we have a lot of wind, it's in that far southwest corner of Minnesota. And a lot of that has gotten developed. Um, so I think it's harder to build some new huge wind projects. But we have some member companies that are, you know, pursuing some large developments there. So I think, you know, we need them both. They operate at different times uh, often, and they're really complementary. Where you often have a lot of wind production at night and a lot of solar, obviously, in the day. Um, and so they're really complementary uh, sources of generation. So hopefully both. Cool. Uh, here's a question for, for everyone or anyone. Uh, what are the biggest challenges or what are some of the challenges for the environment and green energy solutions in general today? I could start. Um, I think one of the ones that's had a lot of interest in Minnesota and has um, been more of a talking point is where we source materials. So we need, you know, so solar panels and batteries require heavy metals and that requires mining. And so where, from where are we mining these materials um, and how, like what's that supply chain look like? And I think we've seen a lot of innovation in batteries that require less and less cobalt and um, lithium 
Um, and you know, there are, there's a, a new, like lots of innovation around recycling of those so that you don't ever have to mine new materials. We could use all of the lithium ion batteries that we currently have. Um, but I think that's a big challenge in both how do we source materials that work for uh, our environment and for the economy, but then also how do we ramp that up fast enough to get to the amount of production that we want? Because right now we're in a global um, supply chain drama and then there's a chip shortage. And so I have had like um, our solar members struggle to get panels right now. And like some orders have been canceled or other things are just hard to get right now. Um, so I think, you know, as the world recovers from all of the shifts that have happened in the pandemic, there are pieces that we need to kind of figure out along that whole supply chain. Thank you. Um, I was going to add just, I, um, I mean, you know, as we've all talked about the industries in the midst of a really significant transition right now, and it's, I think, both a challenge and an opportunity um, that a lot of folks are talking about it, around how do we not just sort of um, perpetuate some of the same, um, you know, harms and burdens that the energy system of the past has perpetrated on communities and like use the clean energy transition as an opportunity to really expand participation and benefits. Um, you know, we could just build wind and solar and have it only benefit, um, you know, companies with a lot of money or folks that are already in the industry um, only build in certain areas. But how do we really figure out a way to use this transition as an opportunity to, um, to do some reparative work um, around the, again, what, what our system has, how it's been built in the past. Yeah. And then I think when you, when you look at it from a community level, I think, you know, it's, it's a big challenge to figure out how, how are we going to get all of our, our housing, you know, up, up to speed and efficient and cost effective, um, how are we going to retrofit fit our older housing stock um, of all different types from single family to huge multifamily, um, and then making sure like when we're building new, we're building smart, but also affordable. Um, someone had mentioned kind of the um, this challenge between affordability and efficiency and making sure we're, we're being um, careful in how we do things. So we get long-term benefits that, that people can improve the quality of their life as well through these improvements. So I think there's, um, there's like when you think of your individual household, like there's there's these fine these finite opportunities where you can make changes, and if you miss those, so like your water heater breaks, you know, on Sunday morning, and you have an emergency repair to get it fixed, you're not going to replace that again for you know 10 to 12 years. Same way if your furnace goes out. So somehow getting some systems in place where we can better plan for these things in an affordable way, because people can't just drop, most people can't just drop thousands of dollars um, and then do it again in a couple more years, right? So I think these are all challenges at an individual level for us to think about as well and, and doing it, as Julia was saying, equitably. So um, everyone gets the benefit of it. It's gonna help their individual household, the community and, and the whole climate. Yeah. And I think too, you know, like kind of zooming out from that, it's a huge cultural shift to try to think differently about how we use energy, think differently about how we build our buildings and set up our communities and do all of this stuff. And cultural change is hard. It's really hard. So I think that's like the biggest challenge because energy is such an interesting space where Everybody needs it and hardly anyone thinks about it. What are some, some ways you think we could educate the, the public? And you know, this one last question along those same lines, what are some practical steps people could take in their everyday lives to support clean energy and help advance a clean energy economy? Um, there was a comment in the chat about energy efficiency, like that, that is like the easiest thing 
everyone can do. It simple as just adjusting your thermostat um, will save you money. It, it reduces the demand for energy. It, it's simple, doesn't cost you anything. That's our number one recommendation. So 68 when you're at home for heating, um, reduce about 10, up to 10 degrees when you're asleep or away, it's kind of a personal comfort issue. Um, things like that can have a big impact and then taking opportunities to, to make your more, home more efficient as, as you're able to. Last, how do we scale a community focused approach for positive environmental actions and green energy solutions and reach more people? You know, how? Are there any steps your organizations are doing, you know, beyond what you discussed, you know, to make this these changes, you know, more widespread? Um, yeah, I mean, I and I see that Peter has a, a question here too around, you know, there's always the balance in conversations around climate action, energy work, um, where there's the sort of micro, you know, things that you can do. Uh, in your individual home versus these big decisions by our utilities or um, big companies. And it's, you know, it's like, I think of both and, um, you know, my, my organization is called, uh, it's focused around market transformation. So this idea of like, how do we influence these major levers so that things like energy, so that to, to make some of those both cultural and market changes so that the default choice is the more um, efficient or sustainable thing. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I do think that, that, you know, the individual choices we make do have influence and do, uh, add up to some of the cultural changes. Um, but there's also that, I mean, I, I like personally like to think about, I get to do this for my day job, but also think about, you know, what are we doing in our household? And also what are the things I'm looking to do to influence policy? Um, I, I think locally first and then also nationally. And I, I posted a link to like one of the campaigns organized locally on caucus for climate that's looking on to influence the, the platforms of all the parties in Minnesota around climate solutions. Um, there's some of the work being done at the city level, you know, talking to both your legislators, like Virginia said, and also our city council members. Um, like I said, they're updating a climate action plan. There's talk about a green new deal in Minneapolis. Um, so there's, there's lots of lever, you know, levels and levers of influence, I'll say. Thank you. Um, we'll have time for one more question for everyone. What's what's one thing that, that would excite you about the future of green energy and environment? Any innovation or anything that you see I about mean, the future? Yeah, I think I say that I love being in this industry because it's such a crazy time right now. Like it's there's so much that is changing. And you know, there's always new technology. There's all this um, this push, and it's a huge transformation and cultural change, like I was saying before. Um, so, I am excited about what I do, and I love. Um, yeah, I think looking at the potential that we have both at the state with this. $7.7 .7 billion surplus and the $1.2 billion from the American Recovery Plan and all of the money from the um, infrastructure bill, hopefully climate action at the national level. I think 2022 could be a really good year. Thanks. Julia, uh, Carmen, what's one thing that excites you about the future? Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, similarly, you know, there's, it, it's, it's an exciting time. There's lots going on. I do think we're seeing some more leadership while there's not like the congressional policy action as much as we'd like to see. Um, you know, we work a lot with the federal agencies and there's like some really smart thinkers. Um, you know, there's some good appointments and people that they have in leadership roles at the federal level that feel like they're lining up more with the local priorities. Um, so I think, yeah, Department of Energy is gonna have a lot more funding out. Um, and I I mean, I think I, back to the challenge question is like getting an, enough people educated in and familiar with the energy industry and jobs in this space. Um, and I think there's some really cool programs um, starting up around that and like working more with youth and job training programs. Um, 
but yeah, I'm excited to see like what the next decade holds for the industry overall. Thank you. Yeah, well, and I think just kind of from a practical level, the, the thing that makes me like optimistic and excited about the energy transition is just the economics are working. So it's almost a not a no brainer. Um, it, it's hard to argue when, you know, wind and solar are, are becoming such low cost options for providing energy that, you know, like coal just is not cost effective. There, you don't really have a, a good argument to continue with those things. So I think the fact that the, both with um, the environmental push to make things cleaner, as well as the econ economics driving it, it is a really good combination that I think um, provides a lot of opportunity um, for this transition to continue in, in the right direction. You know, one, one point, just wanna, I think the, the, the point about jobs and future of jobs, you know, green energy jobs, you know, one thing that, um, and just training people on, you know, how do you think a, a training program could work for youth specifically or, or anyone, but, but just how, how could more people get the skills to get it or get into, you know, green energy industry? It's a million dollar question. I think if you have a, a great answer for me, let me know. Um, I, there are really great programs that are across Minnesota working with youth, uh, the Red Lake Nation, the White Earth Nation, um, working in different high schools to connect them with trade schools and, you know, just helping to talk more with young people about the industry. I mean, I think uh, one of the things that I'm, I feel is everybody who's younger cares so much about sustainability and that's just part of their ethos. And so the more that companies can talk about how they are meeting those goals, the easier it will be to hire. Great, great. Um, that's uh, everyone, uh, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Um, gonna wrap it up, give everyone, uh, all of our speakers a chance. Any final thoughts? Um, we'll start with Julia. Uh, yeah, I know it's been a pleasure to chat with you all. Um, I, I do think, I mean, again, I think some of the coolest solutions are also coming from this local level and that kind of planning for, um, even neighborhood scale clean energy projects and resilience, I think that's gonna serve us uh, in a lot of different ways, just having these conversations among neighbors. So appreciate being a part of it. Thank you. And thank you um, for speaking tonight, Julia. Uh, Virginia, any closing thoughts? Um, thanks for having me tonight. I think my, like to answer Peter's question about that balance, I think the more that we can do to advocate for policy change, the better. Um, because so much of those choices are being made at a really big scale, and that's the big driver of climate change. Definitely. Uh, thank you. Um, Carmen. Yeah, I just want to encourage anyone who has any energy issues to reach out to us. Um, love to talk to you and talk through options for your household or if you know if people are struggling to pay their bills um, or have questions, please pass on our contact information. We're really here to help and we love hearing from consumers. Thanks for your time tonight. And thank you. Uh, I wanna thank all our speakers again. Uh, this was a great, great talk on a very important subject and topic um, for today and for the future. Um, it's a critical moment uh, for the environment in Minnesota, Minneapolis and the world. And we wanna do all we can to help uh, reverse climate change, support green energy. So thank you, Julia Eagles, Virginia Rudder, and Carmen Carruthers for being here tonight. Really appreciate your time and information and insights. Um, if anyone wasn't able, uh, also thanks to all the audience who joined us um, and participated in this talk. If you know anyone who wasn't able to join us, we're gonna, this video was recorded and, and will be available for viewing. Um, so please share it. Um, widely and so many people uh, can see it as possible. There's a lot of great information in here. Our next Lena talk will be on advancing equity in public schools. Uh, that talk will be on Wednesday, February 23rd, 7 p.m. And our speaker will be Heather Anderson, Director of Organizing for the newly formed Advancing Equity Coalition. Hope to see you at our February Lena talk. Until then, please keep supporting uh, local community um, and in whatever way you can. And until next time, thank you all and have a great night.
Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Peter.